So the equipment that we have right there, the main equipment that you would want for this is that you're gonna have an aspirator, which I have out in my vehicle outside, and an umbrella and a stick. And then we were using pint ice cream cartons to ship beetles, so ice cream was no longer ice cream, it was a Laracobius container. And I had to eat those just to make sure. That's a, all right. So we also use cup of soup, but this is now, this is a picture from Seattle where if I'm sending stuff to a laboratory that's, uh, that needs stuff, I can put live stuff in there. If I'm shipping it out to a place that has a concern about it, I put those beetles on Excelsior or Spanish moss and put just a couple little uh, sheets of sugar water in there. Um, I've shipped them off to Pete Gurdon where I was still in Seattle for a week and I got back and I went to Pete's office and I said, what'd you do with that last batch of beetles that I sent you? And he went, <gasps> they were still in the refrigerator upstairs and he'd forgotten about it. So I told him every beetle that dies, I've got to spank you one spank. Well, we opened that thing up and no, none of the beetles were, they were all, because they're that tough. So, you know, I mean, you almost have to try to, that's one of the reasons we've been successful, right, is these things have established in spite of what we did, and now they're everywhere. That's the way I'd say it. All right, so we're able, we were able to go out west and collect, Pete and I, in a nine-day period, collected 3,500 beetles for Grandfather Golf and Country Club. We would make, uh, the releases would be 300 beetles each. We had extra He'd give them to me and he'd say, you know what to do and you know where to go, don't you? And I'd say, yeah, I'm going to Beach Bog now. And I'd take 100 beetles up and I'd go up to where those big coyotes are. They're as big as wolves up there. Throw these beetles out. So there's beetles in Beach Bog. There's beetles in Sims Pond. There's beetles uh, any place that we could think of that had big trees that we needed to save. We put beetles out there pretty much. And, and you'll be able to see that in a minute. So here's Pete out with me in Seattle. He's pounding away. This is pictures in your guide sheet, by the way. This is how we collect. Look at the size of this tree. This is a, this is a tree in uh, Green Lake Park called Woodland Park. These, these are all hemlocks out there. They're all this big. They're all about 120 feet high. They have a big skirt on them, about the, half the size of this room. And the limbs hang down and they're loaded with adelgids. They've never been treated. These trees look great. So we're pounding along. And I want to know whether Pete's good at collecting beetles. I said, hold still just for a minute. And then look on his collar. Look in there. There's a beetle on his collar. And so he's a beetle collecting fool. So what we were doing is taking an umbrella and pounding and knocking all the stuff into it. That's what we'll do out here. Even if it's misting or raining, it doesn't matter. That's a, that's a sunny day in Seattle. Okay. If you look up close on that beach sheet, you're going to see these little black beetles. They're out there. I, I did one beat yesterday out here and I was getting beetles just right off the... So that's part of the educational garden now. The educational garden out there is not just all that stuff that's flowering. It turns a corner and there's three stressed out hemlocks there that is a lesson for people. If you want to go out there and see beetles at work and see what's going on, there they are. Okay. So we would suck these things up with an aspirator and if you've ever been in a park in Seattle or Puget Sound with an aspirator, it looks like you're inhaling various herbs and spices to the rangers that are out there. So they always come up and, they, and the first thing they do is they say, dude, that's, they'll still bust you just as fast as the ones back here, but they do say dude first. And then I'm like, no, 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 come here, look at this. I'm not, I'm not inhaling vegetable matter. So here's 106 beetles in a little, in one of these, in one of these uh, aspirators. If you guys are interested, I can get these aspirators for you. My company, BioQuip, went out of business, and so I'm scrounging to get these things. But if, for people that need them, we can get set up to do it. So now I'm dumping 100 beetles into one of those little pint cups, and then I'm going to add a whole bunch of food, or I can add Excelsior or whatever, and then we can overnight ship these things by lying. You can't tell people that you're shipping beetles. They won't do it. So I go up. The best one I can tell you guys, these are my wife's gloves. And if that guy's married, he will, he will break the law to make sure that, that those gloves get overnighted to your wife because he understands the importance of those gloves. Okay, So those things get shipped overnight very quickly. They get put out. And then we just, we do, um, we do evaluations. And I'm going to run through these next slides pretty quick. 
This is Hemlock Hill, release site number one. We put 30 beetles on that tree and it's dead as a doornail. <laughs> we didn't have enough beetles. We needed 300 beetles on a tree like that. So we were able to do that at Grandfather because I was able to go to their board of directors, shark tank them, and they gave us enough money to go out and when we could put that amount of beetles on these trees, in a, in a four year period we put out 14,000 beetles at Grandfather Golf and Country Club and they quit using pesticides because we were getting, you could see the adelgids just being gone. It breaks it into patch dynamics, that's what goes on, okay. So here's the first beetles that we found the very next year. This is 2004. This is after Hurricane Francis and Ivan, by the way. That area got 46 inches of rain and we still were picking up beetles because they're from the Pacific Northwest. They don't care about rain, okay? We're beating on the trees. We're finding these beetles. We're going out twice a month. We're doing all that stuff. And they, I had to break protocol because Virginia Tech knew who I was and they said, now we know that you're kind of you seem to break rules and do these odd things, so we want you to follow this protocol. So for a year and a half, I followed that protocol, and then I was at one of these sampling sites, and it's a nice and cold. I said, if I was a beetle, I'd be up in the sun up here on this hemlock up here. So after a year and a half of not finding any, I walked up onto that, le that, that uh, ridge. The first beetle, I got six beetles, which all of a sudden I realized these beetles are in sun tunnels in the winter. And as soon as I broke protocol, I began to find beetles like crazy because now I was going where the beetles were rather than following some fixed sampling pr program, okay? So we're going out, we're taking a 40 foot tall, that's a 40 foot pole pruner to get samples off of there. And the other thing that we will see outside when we pound now is we're gonna see these bigger larvae. You remember that little larva in there with all those little eggs? Look at this guy now. This guy's been going around, cruising around, eating those eggs. The other thing that I like to see under the scope is when those crawlers are going by, that larva will grab a crawler and grab it by the head and bite off a chunk and blow it up and down a few times like a balloon and then suck it in and just pop it off to the side. After seven years of watching trees die with no cure and thinking it was terrible, I just love to watch this stuff happen. It's like revenge of the, of the force, okay? The other thing you can see up there, look at that oversack. See that oversack and see all those eggs there? That's about 30 or so eggs. So what we would end up doing is we would count all that and we'd count about 50 oversacks that are undisturbed just to kind of come up with what the average is. Every year it varies because it depends on what's cold, hot, how long it's cold, how long it's hot. But at Grandfather, we dissected about 10,000 oversacks and back then, this is before the polar vortex by the way, we got about 24 eggs per oversack because it's nice and cold there, okay? So that red bar is showing that the larva is showing up and when we got to about a third of the oversacks having an egg or larvae in it, we realized now there wasn't enough food. And what these things do, they immediately turn and attack each other. They're just like human beings. It's great. When they get stressed, the first thing they do is they go kill the smaller one of them. And ladybugs do that too. That way they stay in an area. If you think about it, if they've eaten the food out of an area, and now it's just down to 10 larvae of various sizes, those larvae are gonna look at each other and they go, I think I can eat you. But they stay in that area. See, they're still in that area. So that's why we would always find these beetles in low, medium, and high density, okay? So here it is in, in uh, Banner Elk in 2010. This is after that 2003 release of 300 beetles. We started finding them a half a mile away. We started putting them out at Grandfather and we kind of felt like those beetles were just going in every direction off of that mountain. Every time there'd be a windstorm, I'd call Pete up, say, how far do you think those beetles went, Pete? And Pete would go, well, Mr. PhD, the winds were blowing at 70 mile an hour. How far would they go in an hour? And I'd go, 70 miles. And he'd go, boy, you are smart. All right. So here's a diorama of Grandfather Golf and Country Club from up at the top of Grandfather Mountain, but you see that 18-hole golf course, and in a, in a four-year period, then we released more than that, but that, that was an operational release of beetles in this area, okay? And then once they get going, now we don't need to go out west. We can go out here, we can go to various spots around here that have adelgid hedges, and as long as we manage them, we can sell and move beetles, okay? So here, here would be 2012, here you are by 2014, 
we knew that beetles were out all in this area here. They had dispersed out because we had been putting beetles out. And I'm going to let Blake talk about the other thing, but I, I'm going to flash this up because it was here. And that is the recoveries that, that he's going to talk about later where we had releases and recoveries. Now, the other thing that's been happening is it do, it's not only working here. The reason that it worked here and it worked so well is we have spruce, pine, fir. We have Every one of the conifers has an adelgid, right? So pines have pine bark adelgid. Spruces have coolie spruce gall adelgid. Firs have balsam woolly adelgid. So when we dropped this beetle into the high country here, it was like it was back in the Puget Sound. It had everything it needed. The whole buffet was there. They reproduce on pine bark adelgids too, by the way, okay? So now we go up to Delaware Water Gap. And the reason that I knew that it should be established up there was I was the one that sent these guys all their beetles from Seattle. And when I first went up there, they said they couldn't find any at all. The reason was they were using a white beet sheet pounding onto, uh, onto a white surface, and those larvae look white, and they couldn't see them. So the first thing I did was show up with a colored umbrella. The very first beet, I got 12 larvae, and I realized that part of this is training people to see things the right way. When the head of the program, who's not an entomologist, tells me that there's no beetles in Delaware Water Gap, and here's what I find. Not only are they everywhere, but look at the ones out 35 miles to the west, because I was staying in a hotel out there at Hickory Run, near Hickory Run State Park, okay? So this is years ago now. So this area is totally loaded, and uh, Lear sent me a really nice uh, article where Forest Service is moving beetles from, the, uh, from Rocky Gap into the Flight 93 National memorial because they have hemlocks there. And in the past, they would have been resistant to this. But we were the people that showed these guys first how to use this thing. And then I'm going to do one other thing here, which is I want to show you guys how this works under ultraviolet light. Okay, I'm spending 100 nights a year in a hotel in Seattle down. <laughs> I can only afford $50 a night, and that puts me with working rooms on either side of me. Let's just put it that way. And my hotel was run by Ukrainians. And the smallest, the smallest Ukrainian I ever met was about this big. And he ran, he ran the, the hotel. I had read in my bug journals one night that bed bug poop glowed bright green because it's a blood feeder. And so I decided to go to Archie McPhee's Novelty Shop in Seattle, which for those of you, that is like this crazy shop. You know, it's got uh, three-foot-long plastic roaches, you know, all the stuff that entomologists just absolutely need. So I went there, and I bought two ultraviolet pen lights. I went back to my hotel room. The very first thing I see is bright green poop going down to the, to the plastic baseboard, and here's a whole family of bed bugs. So I put one in a vial, and I go up front to my buddy and I say you've got bed bugs how do you know those are bed bugs I have a beep beep PhD in entomology okay I have something for you he walks over to a cubby hole and he pulls out a, a card, and it's a Starbucks card for $20 of coffee. And he gives it to me. <laughs> and in the meantime, I'm thinking, because I'm looking at this guy, and I'm like, whatever this guy gives me, I am accepting with pleasure <laughs> and saying thank you. Okay. Now, one night, my wife happens to be gone to Raleigh, and I go and do all my crazy, uh, I call it Mad Sigmund. So I go out under a hemlock that's right near me that I knew had Laracobius beetles all over it, and I took that pen light and shined it on the tree. I start seeing this orange stuff, and I can't figure, okay, so I clip this branch, and I bring it in, and every ovisac that's orange, I touch it with a needle, and a Laracobius larvae jumps out. Suddenly, I realize this is predator poop. Predator poop glows bright orange because adelgids have quinones in their blood. And that's how they're, that's their antifreeze. And so all the predators that feed on adelgids when they poop, their poop glows bright orange. 
Well, the only predator that's out this time of year is this beetle, okay? So we have samples over here, and we'll go out and do some other ones. And you can see this bright orange poop. And the other thing that you're seeing, um, and it's hard for me to take these pictures with an iPhone, but this is what we had to do and use time-lapse photography. This is chartreuse, this color here. I had to learn fluorimetry colors, by the way. So that's, that's yellow-green. That's your antifreeze color. And that's the blood of the adelgid. When the beetle bites the adelgid and feeds on it like a vampire, it leaves blood splatter just like vampires do. Okay? So here a beetle has eaten an adelgid, and here is predator poop coming down. You're going to see this. So you can take this flashlight and go out. You can either clip some and go to a darkened room or go out at night and light it up. And if you have this, you don't really need to treat. If everything else is good with your hemlock, you've shown that the, the presence of the adelgid there. If you have an intact oversack of the adelgid with a little honeydew on it, it glows blue-white. Okay. Here's a bunch of blood splatter. So here's blood splatter at Lee's McRae. Nobody knows about it. But there it is out in the forest. There's, if you could hear these adelgids scream, I bet it would sound really terrible. <laughs> Aye, ah. All right. So we published this. This is a published. Yeah, you can turn. Um, this is a published paper. Um, I have this in digital form for you guys. The chemists in Great Britain and Germany had figured this out in the 1920s because. Pine bark adelgid had gotten to Europe, and the chemists had taken these adelgids and figured out all the aphids and all these things that glowed. So there's a paper on that. And then I'm just going to summarize and stop here, okay? So normally you don't get this, but we got amazingly effective control of hemlock woolly adelgid with one predator that turns out to be critical because it lines up with the photosynthetic activity of a hemlock and it gives them those carbohydrates back, okay? That's, that's the big thing there. We also know what the threshold is. If you have less than 30% of your needles infested, that tree will grow normally. Now, hedges are another subject which we can talk about in a little bit, okay? Beetles consume an average of about 97% of dense adelgid infestation, so we'll see some of that outside. Um, we've got operational levels here. Um, once again, what I would say to start with, and I'll end with a, grow, a, a slide just of a really pretty little hemlock, proper identification of the pest is number one. And although we had identified this pest as being hemlock woolly adelgid in native to Asia, we did not correctly identify this pest. It wasn't until 2006 that we actually understood and our map of the world that I showed you from before, which was just Europe, suddenly got a lot bigger and we began to understand the, eco the hemlock ecosystem, how this predator acts in that system, and how we can bring balance back into our watersheds because this beetle not only eats hemlock woolly adelgid, it eats pine bark adelgid, it eats balsam woolly adelgid, and it eats coolie spruce skull adelgid. So it's improving hemlock uh, growth on Hawksbill when you have Carolina hemlocks. If you go over to Roan Mountain where you're loaded up with Fraser firs, this beetle's cruising through there eating balsam woolly adelgid. Okay, so I will stop with this, but this is what I see in my woods even though I have adelgid. So what I do now when I go out and if I'm going to go out and collect and we can look at some of these bushes out here, I'm going to look at what the crown looks like if it has yearling growth that the adelgid can get on, and in almost every instance where you have beetles and that tree is sitting in a decent spot, it's game over. That's all you have to do.